All right, welcome back, everyone. We're ready to start with Genesis 2. And uh, let's open with the word of prayer first. Heavenly Father, you have made us, you have made man and woman, you formed the man out of the dust of the earth, you formed the woman out of man, and into both you breathe the breath of life. We thank you for this gift that you have made us like the beasts in a body, and yet you've also given us a rational soul. So bless us now, open to us the word, that we may know who we are, but most especially know who you are through your son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen. Okay, so... We ended up last week, six days, and what, what pronouncement did the Lord make over creation after six days? Behold, it was very good, exceedingly good. So now the next task at hand, the next thing is going to be the Sabbath, right? This is a Hebrew word that means rest. Okay, with that in mind, let's take up the first, uh, let's say, three verses. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. Okay, so why does God rest? Is it because he's tired? No, he's God. Why does he rest? It's an example, and, and it's going to be a command with his people Israel, right? He's going to command his people Israel that they rest on the seventh day. By the way, which day is the seventh day of the week? Saturday. Your HR department wants the week to begin on Monday. That's weird. The first day of the week is Sunday, right? On Easter. What's the reading for Easter? On that day, the first day of the week, the disciples being, you know, right? What's the first day of the week? Sunday. That's why we in the New Testament, that's us, we worship on Sunday, not because, as the Seventh-day Adventists will claim, that the Pope changed the Sabbath to Sunday. No. The Sabbath is still Saturday. We don't worship on the Sabbath. We worship on the Lord's Day, the day of resurrection, the first day of the week, Sunday. Rest on Sunday because that's there used to be a lot more rest on Sunday because nothing was open. That's right. And, and so here's the thing, right? The way that Israel was is the way the Western world has been regarding the Sabbath. Prior to the Babylonian captivity, Israel had one relationship with the Sabbath. After the Babylonian captivity, Israel had another relation with the Sabbath, right? Prior to the Babylonian captivity, that is when, when, when Judah is taken off and made slaves in Babylon, hi. They were very lax about the Sabbath. They kept trying to work on the Sabbath. I got to get ahead. I got to get ahead, right? And the Lord kept commanding them, no, you need to rest on the Sabbath. That's the command. You rest on the Sabbath. She's getting very brave. So after the Babylonian captivity, they kind of got it. But the way human nature goes, they shoved it into overdrive, and they became very strictly legalistic about the Sabbath, to the point that when Jesus is, is you know, in the flesh, walking the earth, he sees sick people on the Sabbath, 
and does acts of mercy and healing and miracles on the Sabbath. And the Pharisees accuse him of sin. So likewise, we can be kind of lax about God's command to rest and just say, well, it, was, there, it has nothing to teach us. On the other hand, we can go too strict and say, you know, how, how dare anyone work on the Sabbath? Yeah, if I roll into the ER on Sunday, and I have before, I was really glad that there were doctors there. Like, I don't know. It's okay if the hardwood store is closed on Sunday. But, you know, you at least want the doctors to be there, right? You, you want the EMT to show up. So, the command for the Sabbath is strictly given to Israel. It is not commanded of all people. Let's turn to Colossians real quick. Yeah, Colossians 2, 16 and 17. Paul writes in Colossians 2, 16 and 17, Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Okay. Why, why do we need to know this verse besides the fact that it's in the Bible? Because... New Testament Christians are often accused of messing with God's law when we don't follow all the dietary laws given to Israel or all of the religious laws in general. It was a very common trope among the neo-atheists maybe 10, 15 years ago to say, oh, you, you Christians, you say the Bible's the word of God, but you're wearing mixed fabrics and you eat shellfish and pork. For one thing, even Israel is released from that. Rise, Peter, kill, and eat. Don't call anything unclean that I've made clean. Peter himself got to taste bacon. Yes, right. We should write a hymn about that. Oh, the joy, right? <laughs> but you notice, when, when God condemns the Gentiles, right, the goyim, in the Old Testament, does he ever condemn them for not following the laws that are strictly given to Israel? He condemns them for idolatry, adultery, diso disobeying the law written on man's heart. Hebrews 4.4. 4. Actually, I'm going to back it up to 4.1. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear, lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us just as to them. But the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. For we who have believed enter that rest, as he said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this passage, he said, they shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience. Again, he appoints a certain day. Today, saying through David so long afterward, and the words already quoted, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest, so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. Okay, so, what is the Sabbath rest? It's eschatological. It's a matter of the end, right? And it's also now. Through what? Through faith in Christ. We enter the Sabbath rest through faith in Christ. So now the Sabbath is not a when, it's a who. The Sabbath is no longer a when, it's a who. It's always been a who, by the way. As Paul told us in Colossians, these older things were always pointing forward. They were temporary, right? Like what? Like the Sabbath like the dietary laws, like the temple itself, like 
the sacrifices. All of them were temporary, pointing forward to something that was to come. But once the things now come, it doesn't really have a use anymore. It's passed away. The new has come. And so now the Sabbath is not so much a certain day of the week, although for many reasons, resting on Saturday is a good idea. We still kind of do it, don't we? I mean, you can, you can overload your Saturday with all kinds of activities, and you know, but we still have the idea that Monday through Friday has a different character than Saturday and Sunday, right? Those are that, that remnants of that Christianity that used to inform our culture much more than it does now. But they're still here. There's still some semblance. Yes. Anything else so far on this on, on God resting? And notice that is the very first seventh day of all time. So that this concept of a seven-day week is not arbitrary. It's not socially conditioned. It's not culturally conditioned. It's not imposed upon creation by those mean evil Christians. It's been baked into creation from literally the first week of its existence. Okay. Now, the end of verse 3 and beginning of verse 4, or sorry, verse 4. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Okay. Remember when we said the very first time that we talked about this, what, two weeks ago, that the book of Genesis can be divided into ten generations, right? The Tola Doth, the, these are the generations of the heavens and the earth. These are the generations of Adam. These are the generations of Cain and Abel, etc. This is not the beginning of a new section. I think this is kind of the capstone of the preceding one. Now, what we're going to get next is another creation account. Now, some people, when they tell a story, do not tell everything in a perfectly chronological order. And by some people, I mean every one of us, including myself. It's not possible. It's kind of not even desirable. What fun would that be? Sometimes you, you're, you're, des- you're describing some detail, and then you have to, co- to go back and mention, oh yeah, a long time ago, this was set up this way to be like this. So anyway, we get to there, and then we, you know how it goes, right? This is evidence not that the Bible is inaccurate. This is evidence that the Bible is designed to communicate to human beings in the way that human beings communicate. So the first, the first account of creation we get, Genesis 1, and the first little part of 2, that that, though that's not creation, tells it from a kind of long-distance sort of overview. But now we're going to zoom in and look specifically at the creation of the man and the woman. Again, it's not like there were two different creations. The same thing is simply being described two different ways. One is an overview, and two in detail. Okay, so, verse 5. When no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, For the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground, and a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and and the man became a living creature. Aha! See, the Bible's wrong, right? And you Christians didn't even realize it. You rubes! One, one of the many parts of the Bible that are often used to show there's an inaccuracy here. Luther covers this really nicely. He says, Moses is speaking in a rustic way to set up discussion of the creation of the man and the woman. right? But when, when was it that the Lord was causing the mist to come up from the ground and water the earth and plants spring up? Day three, Right? Day 
Verse 7. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. Okay. So, there's a play on words that, that goes on here, and it doesn't work in English too well, but the Hebrew word for earth, Adama, the, the Hebrew word for man, Adam. We usually just call him Adam, but all Adam means is the man. So Adam's name was the man. I mean, it works, right? He's, at that point, the only man. What's that? Yes. Right? Yeah. Yeah, God gave him his name too, right? Sure. But that's, it's, it's also a reminder that all of us are descended from Adam, right? We're of the same, we're the same creature as he is. And that we are also from the earth. And what do we say when we put a body back into the earth? Right. And what do we say on Ash Wednesday? Remember you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Yep. Okay. So notice that the Lord has a similar, has a similar plan for creating man as the animals and that he comes forth from the ground, but God adds something to the man that the animals don't get, and that is what? His own breath. And by the way, there's another play on words, because the word breath also means what? Spirit. Right? In Greek, psyche, psyche, right? Soul. In other words, the man is like the beast's. He comes from the ground, he lives on the ground, he walks around, he's, he, he shares his physiology with the mammals, but there's something more that animates him, and I, I mean literally animates, right? That word comes from Latin anima, meaning soul. He has a soul, he has that, that one extra thing that the animals don't get. God's image and likeness, God's spirit breathed into him. Okay. Okay. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden, in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Okay, so first off, it's good for us to remember where God put Adam. Where did he put him? In the garden. Not in the wilderness, not in the dark, not in deepest space, in the garden. And in the garden, what's around him? Yeah, vegetation, food. So Adam's going to have work to do. However, that work will not be physical. It, it will be physical eventually, or it was intended to be, I think. It won't be frustrating. It won't be fruitless. What's that like? Yeah, me neither. Right. Everything we do, not just farming, but you know, programming and cleaning and, and managing people and everything else has its own, its own frustrations. But Adam was placed in the garden. In other words, a rich, lush place full of food and security, where he can walk with God. I mean, literally paradise. He ha yeah, he, he had work. work. Work is not a result of the fall. Right. Yeah, if, if, you don't believe, if you don't believe this, you won't see that man has a purpose in caring for creation. Right. And by the way, if, if absolutely atheistic evolution is true, not only can you not speak of man having a purpose, you can't speak of things like the heart having a purpose. The, the purpose of the heart is to pump, well, 
Purpose is, is, a, is downstream from intention, right? And it's designer. The most you could say is, isn't it a happy coincidence that everything happened to come together so that the heart pumps blood in a specific way through the body? It's much more sane, that is, it's, it's, much more, um, it's, it's, it's much more in accord with nature, to the mind, to speak of man having a purpose and creation having a purpose. The, the plants were there to feed man. Man was there to tend the garden. Worked out really nicely. Okay, verse 10. Oh, let's, let's not forget the, the two trees, right? What sets these two trees apart is probably not how they're portrayed in lots of artwork where they're, they're separated from all the rest of the trees and there's like this glowy light and everything. What's different about these two trees is sacramental, that is, the promise. So there were two trees? Yes. I mean, there, there were probably more than two trees because God created all the different types of... Well, one, one he was supposed to eat from, one he was not. Right? So you're saying by the word it became something? By the word it became something, yes. Right. There is the promise. The promise that when you eat from the, the tree of life, you have life. When you eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, we're going to find out later, in the day you eat of it you shall surely die, right? So what sets those tr two trees apart is God's, God's command and promise. Right, but where did the right. Yeah, th th there's always the one tree depicted, right? It makes God look really bad, too, when there's only the one tree. It's like, no, there was also the tree that bestowed eternal life on those who ate of it. They always forget that one for some reason. Okay, a river flowed out of Eden to water the garden, and there it divided and became four rivers, right? So, just to make a mental map of this, so it's coming out of Eden, right? One river comes out of Eden, and it waters the garden, and it divided at Eden and becomes four rivers, the name of the first is the Pishon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. Delium and onyx stone are there. Where is the Pishon River? Yeah, I don't know either. <laughs> we, we don't know. Um, and that, of course, becomes a problem, because when you try to place these rivers on the atlas, it becomes tricky when you don't know where the Pishon River is. Now, the, the church fathers, if, if you've ever read the church fathers, the one thing they love to do is speculate. And so some of the church fathers said, well, gold, delium, onyx, it's got to be the Ganges. Uh, okay. Um, some say the Danube. Sure. I mean... <laughs> so continuing... The name of the second river is the Gihon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Cush. Now that one we do kind of know. That one's almost certainly the Nile River. Because where is the Cush? The Cush is that region of Africa where the Nile begins. Okay. The name of the third river is the Tigris which flows east of Assyria. Now, do we know anything about the Tigris River? Yes, sure we do. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. Now, where on the atlas do those four rivers separate from one river and form into four rivers that surround a garden? They don't. Yeah, right, I mean... You can, you can kind of make a mental map, but it requires you to move around either bodies of water or continents. Or maybe some kind of global catastrophe between that day and now. Just throwing that out there. 
Right. One of the things we learn is that this land, it's the same earth that we live on. It's not like Middle Earth or, you know, whatever. But it's different than we know it. And the earth as we know it isn't going to show up for a while because the, the, the longer we get into Genesis 1 through 5, the stranger it's going to look to us. After the flood, it starts looking a bit more like what we're used to. Okay. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day you eat of it you shall surely die. So Adam didn't just have to eat from the tree of life, he could eat from any tree in the garden. But the one. And notice, by the way, what God says. I think most of us hear him wrong. I think most of us hear him say, in the day you eat of it, I will kill you. But that's not what he says. He says, in the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. Worlds of difference, though, right? I mean, he, Adam had to have at least some concept of death because God was talking to him about it. But he had no experience of it. I mean, we know something about heaven, but we have no experience of it. That's, that's as good as I can give you, sorry. He means physical death the way that we know of it. The body and soul are separated and the body doesn't live anymore. And also death, and, and also separation from him. So yes. Because, well, b because it's important because we know death in two senses, right? There's the sense of death in which the body ceases to live. Right? The soul leaves the body and the body is no longer animated. There's also death in the second sense, the second death, where, which is eternal death. Right? The, 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 mean, yeah, meaning se eternal separation from God. Right? And this is what's meant here, both senses. Now, because um, I'm a word guy, um, why is this always depicted as an apple? I'll tell you why. In the Vulgate, evil malus or the, the neuter form is malum. What does malum also mean in Latin? Apple. In fact, the and I don't remember the genus of the apple tree, but the species is malum. Yep. It's at the root of words like maleficent. No, I mean, words mean things. And, and when, when you play around with words, you find out, like, for example, when they take Mormonism and they make it into a sci-fi series, what do they call the guy? Adama. Now God is going to say something he's never said before. At least since he created the heavens and the earth. Then the Lord God said, it is not good. Wait a minute. <laughs> well, yeah, I got to finish the sentence, right? But let's just pause and let that hit us weird for a second. He says it's not good. He's not saying that it's evil. He's saying that it's incomplete, right? Because because it is for him and for for Christians, but for now, for man. He also says it's going to be rare. Okay. It is not good that the man should be alone. Right? So that's... It's striking what he says. He says it's not good, specifically that the man should be alone. He says, I will make a helper fit for him. And again, he... Moses is backing up a little bit to fill in some of the details from before. God is not remaking all of these things here. 
we call this the pluperfect, sets, pluperfect uh, tense, right? God had done this in the past. That's, that's how it works in English with the, the helping verb had. So Moses is filling in the backstory here. Now, out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So Adam had work in the garden. He was exercising dominion. He was giving names to the creatures. Whatever Adam called it, that's what it was, right? It's not, and like we mentioned before, it's not just a just-so story that, and that's why the platypus is called a platypus. It's, it's more about Adam exercising dominion, as in Adam has the power to name these things. And so he is. God gives him that authority, and, and Adam is exercising it over creation, right? The, the point is you can see the headship. Adam has headship over creation. God has headship over Adam. However, Adam is not yet complete in the way that the animals have helpers, he doesn't have one. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This, is at, or this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. That's kind of odd. No suitable helper. Well, he was the only human. Well, that, that was the thing. He was the only human, and so there wasn't a suitable helper because who was going to be his, his wife? None of the beasts. None of the angels. There wasn't anyone else in creation like Adam. However, when God makes a helper for him, he doesn't make the helper in the same way that he made him. But, notice that she is taken from the man. Adam is taken from the dust. Woman is taken from man. When Paul is explaining how things are to work in the church, he brings this up as evidence of Adam's headship over, over his wife. So she's probably did then too. Wouldn't surprise me, but right, right. Yeah. Not till after the fall. But again, notice Adam's headship is given before the fall and Adam before the fall is exercising it for the good of creation. And so will he also with his wife right up until the moment that he doesn't. Yes. And, and to answer your, your earlier comment, if I could explain because of the angels, I would either be Paul himself or an angel from heaven. I've, I've looked at it and I don't, I see lots of speculation, but not, not much is said. And now look at verse 24. And this verse is going to be repeated elsewhere in the scriptures. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. So, marriage was always part of the creation, was always part of the plan. It's instituted before the fall. In days past, we probably didn't need to point this out, but it's worthy of noting, it does say a man and his wife, um, not anything else, not a man and another man or whatever. But notice the man is leaving father and mother, and holding fast to his wife. So now his highest duty is no longer to his parents. His highest duty is now to his wife, at least earthly, right? But here we have a definition of marriage where God, God gives this woman to this man, this man to this woman. What does it mean they're naked and not ashamed? I mean, yeah. there's no sin. There's no need to cover themselves. All right. Then next week, we'll take up Genesis 3. I did not anticipate we would get through the whole chapter today. But there we are. We did. 
it's it is fairly straightforward. It's it's territory we kind of know. You may have a different manuscript because the the one that I have, it it does have cleave to his wife. Yeah, pros kale thesetai pros tan ganeka autu. Yeah, my yeah my Greek has it. Okay. Cool. Then let's close with the Lord's prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. All right, thank you.